And I, yes, welcome back everybody. Time to mute your phones. And I hope that our online audience has had the chance to uh, feed themselves as well as we have a very exciting afternoon ahead of us, which starts off with a keynote speech and then two panel discussions. The panel discussions will be the AI paradigm, uh, changing translation, shaping the future, and the translation industry and profession past, present, future. But now for today's keynote with Ashkan Fardost. Ashkan is a musician, an academic with a PhD in organic chemistry from Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, he is an entrepreneur, a philosopher of the future. And apart from being a global speaker, he also teaches at the International Business School Hyper Island and runs one of Sweden's fastest growing podcasts. So, welcome Ashkan Fardost for Everyone Has Misunderstood AI. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the lovely introduction, Anna, and thanks for having me here today. I'm honored to be here. Now, I'm going to run through the history of mankind and her relationship with technology for the last 30,000 years in under 40 minutes or so. So, I better get started immediately. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not a translator, I'm not a linguist, I am nothing of the sort, so I'm not here to solve any of your problems or make a specific point. I don't have that talent. But being the self-proclaimed, self-taught, aspiring cyber anthropologist that I pretend to be, I'm here to cause more problems. Because I think when we cause more problems, we start to think in new ways, and I believe we have to start to think in new ways because the way we discuss AI, or AI, I should say, is leading us astray. The question is usually something like, will intelligent machines replace human work? And I don't think that's a good starting point. I would rather ask, why have human beings behaved and worked like machines for the last 200 years? And if we ask that question, we can actually get some new insights that will hopefully help you put your problems and questions into that way of thinking. So, for a talk with AI in the title, I'm going to talk remarkably little about AI. That's not the point. It's been covered yesterday, it's been covered this morning, it's going to be covered tomorrow as well. It's been covered on YouTube. We kind of know what it is, technically speaking. So that's not what I'm going to do. I would like to provide context, or rather set, put AI in a radically new context. And in that way, hopefully, help us start to think in a new way. And I'm going to do this by going through three epochs that I believe are the most important epochs in human history. Happened three times, it's very rare. And I'm going to argue that we're entering a fourth epoch right now as we speak. And it's in this light that I believe we must examine AI. Now, I would kindly like to ask you to look around in this room, in every direction possible from where you're sitting, or if you're sitting at home or at the office watching online, look around the room and try to point at something in this room that is so-called natural. <laughs> except for your human bodies. Yeah, some of you are pointing to the light. Yeah, light from the outside. But the light from the outside is filtered by the glass, so a lot of the UV rays go away. It's artificial light. Plants don't grow like that in nature. <laughs> That's a human-made plant. Somebody said the air we're breathing. AC machines don't grow on trees. It's human-processed air. What I'm trying to say is that you probably will find nothing that's natural in this room. Yes, except for your bodies. It's really hard to find something natural in the room we're in, and most of the times in the rooms we are in, because most of the things around us today are extensions of our own bodies. Technology around us, all the things in this room are extensions of our bodies. And because they are extensions of our bodies, we tend to forget that they're even there in the first place. So for example, the clothes you're wearing right now are extensions of your skin. They're doing many of the functions that your skin already does, but it helps you save time and energy 
which you can use for other tasks. For example, by not spending your own energy to keep you warm. The AC system in your car or in this room is an extension of your lungs. It helps you breathe better in the set environment that you're in. The buildings we spend our days in and go home to at night to our apartments and houses are also extensions of our skin, but they're also extensions of our body heat preserving systems. They're extension of our tribal territory. It keeps us safe and, safe and so on and so forth. The car or bicycle or bus or whatever you took to come here today is an extension of your feet. You could have, I could have traveled from Sweden here by feet. It would just, just take a very long time. So it's an extension of your feet. The stove top in your kitchen is an extension of your gut. It chews the food for you. So you can save a lot of energy in your gut and intestinal system, and then that energy can go somewhere else, maybe to our brains, so we can think in new ways. So in contrast to the chimps, we don't have to spend six hours a day to chew raw vegetables. That's what a chimp does. If we had to do that, we wouldn't have time to build civilization. So this is what we humans do. Our biological niche is that we don't have a niche. We're experts at coming to a new environment, and we start feeling things that are uncomfortable. It's too cold, it's too windy. So then we start to extend our bodies, and our bodily extensions, that's what technology is, become part of the environment. That's what we humans do. Put human beings anywhere on the planet, most of the time they'll figure out a way to extend their bodies and transform the environment so that it suits their way of living better. You can barely find a single example in archaeology where you find a human being without some kind of trace of some body extension being involved there. Even when you find these, you know, naked skeletons that's been, you know, buried on the ground for 50,000 years and there's nothing around them, and we, you know, show them up to the world in a press conference and say, look, we found the oldest human. And then we give them some name like Bruno or something. This is Bruno from 50,000 years ago. But Bruno has a hole in his head. And that hole isn't natural. It's from a spear because Bruno had a friend that he didn't like anymore. So they had a fight, and Bruno got killed by another extension of the body. A weapon, sword, spear, an extension of our fist or teeth or nails and something like that. We are natural-born cyborgs. Technology is not separate from us. It's an extension of us. So that's a false dichotomy. We extend our bodies, and we paint the landscapes with our synthetic prosthetics. That's what human beings do. And we paint the landscape so much with our synthetic prosthetics that we even forget they're there. We forget they're even there. Because we're also narcissistic, yeah? We think we're in control. We think we know what we're doing. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I watch my phone a little bit too much, but I know what I'm doing. Yeah, that's a TV, that's a chair. It's technology around me, but I'm me. I know what I'm doing. Have you heard the story about London cab drivers? To get a London cab driver license, you have to pass a test that's called the knowledge. And to pass the knowledge, you have to spend roughly three years full-time traveling the city of London by foot or bike or motorbike and memorize every corner, street, nook and cranny of the entire London map to pass that test. And neuroscientists love this. When they figured this out, they asked a bunch of cab drivers, to do an experiment before they started their studies and after they were completed with their studies. And they scanned their brains and found that people who spend three years traveling and exploring the city of London and try to memorize every part of the city, a special part of their brain starts to grow. The hippocampus takes care of spatial memory. So the brain starts to reconnect and reshape itself depending on the environment that it's in. It's called neuroplasticity. We've known this for a while now. So imagine if three years of studying a map does this to your brain. Imagine what the technological environments we've painted our surroundings with do to our brains since childhood till adulthood. Now here's something important to accept. It might be hard to accept. But we human beings, we don't change. 
our DNA, our biological machinery that we have, it's roughly the same as people, let's say, 20,000 years ago. Evolution in biology is too slow. There's been some changes, metabolism and things like that, but in general, we don't change that much. We like to think that we change. We've con convinced ourselves of this idea that we humans of the modern day and age were much better than humans before, yeah? We have better morals and ethics. We have democracy and human rights and philosophy and science. Surely we have developed. If that's the case, if I go to Google Trends and see what people search for, because I don't listen to what people say they do. People usually lie. I look at what they actually do. And thanks to Google and all the data we have, we can now figure out what people think. Because what you put in this Google search box reveals what you really think about because you think nobody's there. But I'm there. I'm looking. So on Google, people searching for philosophy, democracy, human rights, science, and all these things are all in the bottom. Whereas the line at the top that trumps all of these fine values that we humans have starts with a P and ends with Ornhub. <laughs> we like to think we're better, but we're always the same. But the technology around us change. And the technology around us reshape our brains, and that reshaping results in us behaving slightly differently, acting slightly differently, perceiving the world slightly differently. So it's the technological environments around us that change. And every now and then, that technological environment changes so drastically and so rapidly almost overnight, seemingly, that our entire mode of life, our entire culture, our worldview, everything changes with it. And it all boils down to language. I know it's easy to say that at a conference about language, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it because language is the first extension of our human body, I would argue. Language is an extension of our mind. With language, we can transfer thought using acoustic waves through the air. It's wireless thought transfer. And I would say it's language. It's our extension of our mind through language, acoustic waves and sound, that actually makes us human. Because language becomes a new layer of information on top of the slow DNA. We can quickly instruct a human being to not touch the stovetop or not run into that dangerous part of the jungle by using language. For DNA to figure that out, it might take generations and thousands of years. So, we humans survive thanks to language because most of the knowledge we need in order to survive, we don't get that with instinct, we don't get that with DNA. We are the animal that is most dependent on information outside of our DNA. That information medium is language, and it's stored inside our brains. But our brains are not that good. We tend to forget. Every December, this is what people search for on Google. How to wrap a gift. <laughs> this is humanity in an essence as well. Every year, a lot of people, I think it's mostly guys, but who am I to know? forget how to wrap a gift, so we go to Google, we Google that, and from this giant repository, we extract that information, do our task, and 11 months later, we've forgotten it. That's because our brains are very limited in how much language information it can store. But that was the first epoch. It made us human, language, 200,000 years ago, give or take 100,000 years. Archaeologists are never in agreement about that. But something like that. And this is how we've spent 98% of the time we've been on this planet. This is default Homo sapiens. This is our so-called original habitat. We live in bands and tribes of nomadic hunter-gatherer, and we use language to mediate information and store information. And with that information, we are able to survive. And during this time, 98% of the time we've been on this planet, not much have changed, because the storage capability is still dependent on our brain. We can't accumulate information. When the elders die, we lose a lot of information. So we have to reinvent stuff all the time. That's why not much change worth talking about happened during this era. And we can learn 
from religious historian Mircea Eliad, for example, that when you track the religions and cultures and myth of oral cultures, they have a cyclical understanding of the planet and the world. Because for them, everything is cyclical. The seasons come and go, the tides come and go, their environment is cyclical, so their culture reflects that environment, yeah? The only thing that permanently changes for them is death. And you solve that by reincarnation or something like that. So you don't go insane and give up hope about life. But something happens roughly 10,000 years ago. People start to settle or semi-settle and do farming. There are different theories of why this transition occurred. We don't have to go into them. Again, everyone is not in agreement. But all over the planet, independently, lots of different human societies started to experiment with farming. Now, farming creates surplus food. So with farming, we now suddenly have more food than we actually need, which means we can spend time on other things than just finding food. And surplus food also means a population explosion we become many, many more people within the community. Now, biologically speaking, our brains are roughly comfortable with keeping up with 300 social relations at the time. When it gets more than 300, we start to forget people's names, who they are, their relationships, and so on and so forth. That's why you still can see today the average Facebook user, when Facebook was at its peak, 300 friends, give or take 20. So this, <laughs> humans don't change, we're always the same. So this creates a new problem. Societies grow. And the concept of meeting a stranger becomes something new that nobody has ever experienced before. Now again, remember, we humans don't change. But our environments change. And when the environment changes, we almost all, every time figure out a way to deal with that change by creating a new narrative, rewriting the story, or figuring out a way to make things work. So this is when you had different settlements living close to each other and people had to deal with strangers. Probably shamans from the different tribes met every now and then in the forest doing their shaman things. And one day they figured out that, wait, you believe in that God, but that God sounds really much like our God. Oh my God, what if it's the same God? We've been believing in the same God all the time. All right, everyone, let's gather. We don't have to fight anymore. It's been a mistake. We all believe in the same God. And for some strange reason, when we meet a stranger, and that stranger believes in the same God as you, we attain trust and we can start to cooperate. We're in Europe now. I'm sure a lot of people in here think, well, you know, we don't believe in gods as much these days. It's not like before. But we kind of do. We just change their names. Democracy, human rights. If I meet a person that says, I hate democracy, I hate human rights, chances are I'm not going to cooperate with that person. I'm not going to be so trustful. But when we have the same values, all of a sudden our trust opens. So proto-versions of monotheism start to take form in this period. And with monotheism in place, societies become stable, and since we're semi-settled, we're sedentary, we don't have to run around all the time, we can start to collect a lot of interesting materials that we find in the forest and bring it back home to the settlement and experiment with that material on our free time. Which means we open up the possibilities for inventing really new cool stuff. And this is when we invent the first information technology that lives outside of our brain, which is written language. With written language, we can store information, language information, outside of the brain, and we can pass it on to the next generation. And when you get accumulation of information, you can build on previous generations' knowledge and learnings, and that means you have civilization. That's the ingredients for civilization. You need surplus food, you need a grand narrative that unites strangers, and you need to be able to store and accumulate information over time. Put the talking monkey on, on a rock in space with the opposable thumbs that we are into that equation, and civilization will pop out eventually. But we just have to rewrite the narrative, yeah? Because with accumulation of information, change becomes permanent. Our experience of the world is no longer cyclical. Reincarnation goes away. We rewrite the stories and we say something like, it's okay if you were born a peasant or a knight or a king. Don't be jealous. 
It's just God testing you. But if you work hard, trust your neighbors, share your resources, are nice to your family, there's going to be a nice reward at the end. No, no, you're not going to be born again. We were wrong about that. But you're going to live for eternity in heaven or something like that. So even the narratives become linear because with accumulation of information, our experience of the world becomes linear. That's roughly 3,000 years ago. That's the second epoch. We have writing, which allows us to have advanced infrastructure for agriculture, which also allows us to spread the monotheistic narrative and expand our territories and societies. This represents roughly 1.9% of the time we've been on this planet. It's kind of a tiny parenthesis. Now I'm going to fast forward here. Not much really happens until 500 years ago, at least here in the West. Because 500 years ago, a new information technology knocks at the door, and today we call it the printing press. And the first figure who figured out that you can use the printing press to cause really new fun problems was, of course, Martin Luther. Martin Luther realized that with the printing press, I can actually distribute information about the narrative and the way the society is supposed to work without asking for permission from the gatekeepers, which were the Catholic Church. Martin Luther realized that print is a mass medium. You can communicate to a mass without asking for permission. So he realized he can take his radical new idea, which was to challenge the status of the Pope, and he could bypass all the traditional gatekeepers. And Martin Luther, when you read the biographies about him, my sense is that he was kind of a boring guy, you know, very angry and wanted to control everything, and he was pissed off all the time. But he was also a genius design thinker and entrepreneur because he wrote his text in German instead of Latin. Revolutionary thing to do because he thought, why should I write in some weird language that only some bearded guys in the church tower understand? I'm going to go with pure folksy German, talk to everyone directly. I don't want some middle hands distorting my message. And he wrote short texts on purpose, because a short text you can spread over lunch or dinner. You don't have to spend five years at a monastery to figure out what the dude has to say. And a short text fits on one sheet of paper, which means you bring down the cost of distribution, plus you can fold the sheet of paper into a tiny pamphlet and secretly spread it to the next person on the street. What I'm trying to say is that Martin Luther basically invented the concept of Twitter, but in an analog format 500 years ago. And his tweet was, of course, the following. Sure, of course, I'll do what God says, but who the hell is this Pope guy telling me how to communicate with God? My relationship with God is mine and God alone. The Pope has nothing to do with this. And people liked the idea. He started to get retweets, went viral, and the rest is history. The same printing press allowed a new group of citizens who happened to be at the right place at the right time we call them the merchants in the history books. And with these printing press products, they could quickly spread information about why, where there are resources, raw materials, market prices, and so on and so forth. And with the same printing press, we could also distribute information about how to build better tools, better machines, better ships. So the merchants stepped on these new ships, traveled to faraway lands, and figured out that if we find a nice resource over here, where supply is high, and we transfer it to where supply is low, but demand is high, we can make shitloads of money. Which means eventually we can make more money than the landlords who are at the top of the food chain. I'm going to fast forward. This culminates in the French Revolution, which lays the foundation for the society we all have sprung out of today. We have a justice system, democracy, human rights, and again, the environment changes. It's no longer written language where a bunch of scribes and priests guard this sacred technology and the people have to follow. Now it's the printing press that dictates the rules. So we have to rewrite the narrative. When Martin Luther started his revolt against the Pope, and further development continued, and people could spread new information and question things, people started questioning God, but we still need people to cooperate. So we exchanged God for the individual. We said, no, 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 you're in charge. You're the God now. You're in the center of the universe. But if you work hard and pay your taxes and follow the law, there's going to be a huge reward at the end. It's not called heaven anymore. We were wrong about that. It's called self-realization. 
If you study hard, work hard, do something nice with your life, one day you're going to wake up and be self-realized. Have you met any self-realized people before? That's how it works. Every country has their own version. In Sweden, the story goes, if you work hard, pay taxes, follow the law, at the end of your life, you will get a Volvo, a villa, and a dog, and you get free pension and health care so you can die in peace. In the U.S., you have the American dream. Anyone who works hard and pays taxes and follows the law can become president. doesn't matter where you're from, where your creed is, and so on and so forth, right? So that's how it works. And then we come home from work and we pray to our new gods and mimic them and talk like them and dress like them. Humans never change. That was the third epoch 500 years ago. And this represents roughly 0.1% of the time we've been on this planet. It's barely a blink of an eye. And we're sitting here and assuming that this is the natural order of things. Isn't it a profound fact that all the raw materials you need to create vaccines, antibiotics, laptops, airplanes, and every other piece of technological marvel we have around us, all the raw material we need to build these things have been here all along. The only thing that prevented people 30,000 years ago, let's say, to turn these raw materials into laptops and airplanes was a lack of information. They simply didn't know how to inform, put into shape, the raw materials to get something new. That's the only thing that stood between them and the world we have today. Humans never change but the technological environments around us change all the time. And sometimes they change drastically, and our entire culture and worldview and mode of life changes with it. And we usually become blind to the technologies that affect us the most. So if I ask you, which technology pervades your life and environment more than any other extension? Which technology is it that has pervaded and been present and all around you for all of your life? Which technology is that? Electricity is one of them, yes. But they're usually in the background doing their thing, yeah? You don't sit and watch the electrical cables, I hope. But which technology have you interacted and engaged with more than any other technology for the entirety of your life? Cell phone, that's the usual answer, because that's the thing we see. Sorry, did I hear something else? Knowledge? (laughs) They're all over the place all the time. When you're looking at your phone, they're there. When you're looking at the TV, they show up. Everywhere you go, they're all around you. Now, this is the interesting part. The Roman alphabet, derived from the Phoenician alphabet, is very unique in the plethora of scripts that we have around the world from different cultures. It's unique in the sense that it's a script that breaks language down into extremely abstract building blocks that mean nothing on their own. The letter B doesn't mean eagle flying over ocean. It just represents the meaningless sound of B. And you just need to learn roughly 26 of them. And with those 26 pieces of Lego, abstract building blocks that don't mean anything on their own, with these 26 building blocks, you can create any word in any language that has ever existed and will exist. I can't take Chinese script and turn it into a Swedish word because Chinese script doesn't represent sound, it represents concept. It's not fully abstracted. Our way of writing is the only system that completely has abstracted language into meaningless building blocks. It's very useful, that's why it spreads so quickly. It's very useful because it's easy to learn 
A three-year-old can memorize all these building blocks and start building their own words with it. But here's what happens. What happens is that we can see today, when we put people in MRI machines and start analyzing their brains, people who have only been exposed to a phonetic script, their brain fires completely differently when they perceive things, when they solve problems, when they do tasks, than a person who has never been exposed to the alphabetic script. The differences are remarkable. Just like spending so much time analyzing the streets of London makes your hippocampus grow, exposing yourself to these abstract building blocks starts to strengthen another set of connections in your brain. First of all, you use your eyes to scan these sequential lines, sequential lines of abstract building blocks. You use your eyes. So when you use your eyes in this way, looking for fine shapes and lines that intersect with each other, certain pathways in your brain start to get strengthened. And when they get strengthened, they start to spread to other parts of the brain, which means your perception starts to prefer to view the world according to how the eyes like to view the world. Have you noticed that our visual sense is the only sense that has a perspective? It's roughly 114 degrees. Our ears don't have perspective. You're always in the center of a periphery, yeah? But our eyes, our vision has a perspective. Our eyes need linearity. Everything needs a beginning and an end. If a horse would just show up all of a sudden on this stage, you would have think you've gone mad. At least the horse has to come in from somewhere, yeah? And if it would just vanish like that, you would also think you've gone mad. It has to exit, at least exit the room. Everything needs a beginning and an end. Our eyes see isolated objects. It doesn't see holes. It tries to find objects to isolate. That's how it views the world. And, again, it's the only sense that has a point and perspective. So what happens is, when we spend a lot of our time since childhood using our eyes to scan sequential lines of abstract building blocks, and that set of sequential abstract building blocks becomes the way we communicate, the way we transmit language. This sets in motion different neuroplastic events happening inside your brain, which at the end of the day results in what neuropsychiatrist Jean-Michel Ogurlian calls the rational brain. The circuitry in your brain that handles logic, sequences, abstractions, analytical tasks, breaking things down into parts, rebuilding a model out of those parts, and this part of the brain also loves order. See? These faculties get strengthened, and we start to make it a habit. This is the way we start to view the world. I don't think it's a coincidence that the idea that the universe, the cosmos, must be made out of tiny little building blocks, and if you put them together the right way, you can create whatever kind of matter you want. Democritus is one of the first generation of thinkers who were exposed to a phonetic alphabet. I don't think it's a coincidence that the idea that form and shape can be abstracted to a set of geometrical building blocks that you can put together to create any form you want comes from Euclid, who's also one of the first generations of thinkers who were exposed to the phonetic alphabet. I don't think it's a coincidence that the idea of Western logic, where you can take different building blocks of truth and put them in a correct sequence and create new truths, comes from a person who is among the first generation of thinkers who is exposed to a fully-fledged phonetic alphabet. And when the printing press arrives, all of a sudden, millions of people can afford to buy written books. So now you have millions of people, not just the philosopher elites and so on and so forth. Regular people now sit hour after hour scanning lines of sequential abstract building blocks. So I don't think it's a coincidence that all the ideas that follow from that is that we start to abstract things even more. The idea of taking human society and pretending it's made up of indivisible tiny little units we call individuals, Individual means indivisible, yeah? So it's an atomification of the human being. Comes from Descartes. And he also abstracted motion into an XYZ plane that we use for math today. I don't think it's a coincidence that we have thinkers like Isaac Newton, 
who rewrites the function of, uh, functioning of cosmos into this mechanical, linear, sequential clockwork. Western civilization is a visual, rational folk. That's how we perceive the world. This is what our technological environment is doing to us. This is not critique. I'm very happy that we have vaccines and laptops and all the other things we enjoy here. It's just an observation. But we are the people who view the world according to the eye. Notice you don't even think twice when I use the word word view. I don't think it's a coincidence that all of our metaphors for knowledge and wisdom is based on visual sight. We elucidate, illuminate, and clarify. We don't want to remain in the dark. We want to become enlightened. This is my point of view. Do you see my perspective? It's all over the place. So the industrial era is basically taking this worldview and having machines to transform the world according to that worldview. We put abstract building blocks on a production line, and it can spit out whatever thing you can dream of. And we get the nation state, because you need mass production of books to do mass education, which also becomes a mass production of identities and worldviews. You can't do that without a printing press. So the nation state relies and rests solely on the fact that we have a past with a printing press who believe we are rational agents on a market, and if we make the right choices in our life, we can become self-realized. So what we do is we break everything down into parts. We put people in departments. We give them job titles, and we say, no, this is your task. You're not allowed to do that. There's another person who does that. And then we print those titles in our LinkedIn cards, and it becomes our identities. And we sit there in this divided departments, do our tiny little tasks all day, and at the end of the line, a product is spit out. We even organize and plan people in a sequential abstract way. We put people and tasks in Gantt charts in a sequential manner, and we expect things to work smoothly. We want to fit the entire planet into an Excel sheet. This is the peak of breaking things down into building blocks with a sequential linear worldview. I said we're going through a fourth epoch as we speak. We can call it many things, but what it is is a digital electronic algorithmic network. It's easier to say the internet, but this sounds cooler. That's what it is. And we have five billion minds now connected, exchanging information 24-7 all over the planet all at once. And we have 15 billion things connected to this network as well. So the technological environment that it sets is an environment where everything happens everywhere, all at once, all the time. This is the new environment that we're dealing with, but we still have a linear, sequential, abstractifying worldview. And it's going to cause problems. We get burned out, we get angry, we get frustrated. People don't want to hire Gen Z because they're crazy and we don't understand them. So... Everyone becomes a mass producer of information, which means we can no longer monopolize the narratives of identities and worldview production. So the grand narratives we've built up so far break down into a myriad of different digital tribes online. So what we do is we enter a global digital tribal society where everything happens everywhere all at once, and the visual, rational mind cannot fully grasp it. I think Wikipedia is an excellent metaphor for how this really works. Wikipedia doesn't have a beginning or an end. There is no order in which you should read Wikipedia. It's just a chaotic network of hyperlinks, and you just jump between them. That's what you do. It reminds us more about how the ear perceives the world. It's nonlinear. There's no beginning or an end. You're not looking for a linear cause and effect when you get input in your ears. There are cars passing by outside. Your brain doesn't try to make sense the sound of a car with what's happening in here. Your ears are perfectly capable of handling simultaneity, everything happening everywhere all at once. So this is the environment we're entering. Now, I said I'm going to talk remarkably little about AI. What I think is fascinating is that A lot of the frustration we experience is that we still try to force our perception of the world into this way of thinking. 
And then a tool like this shows up. And we think, finally, this is going to solve my problems. It's a mathematical system, a formal mathematical system that sequentially, mind you, calculates what word should show up after the previous word. That's really what it does, if we're going to be honest about it. Now, how I see it is that this is just a natural continuation of this digital electric algorithmic network. It's not something that stands on its own. We have AI over here, it's this magical thing, let's figure it out. No, it's just a natural continuation of the internet. Because this thing that we call AI today only works and is useful because it builds on the information shared by five billion minds connected in this network. Without that information, this thing would have been useless. So, what are we to do about this? Will it replace all human work? It seems so at first glance. It's capable of answering a bunch of different hard questions, yeah? Because it has a lot of information to look at. But it's always a mirror of what has happened before. It's always just limited to be a mirror, stuck and shackled by information that has been exchanged by other human beings before. How many Ernest Hemingway fans do we have in this room? A few. Now, I think Walter Ong, media theorist, had a prophetic insight when he discovered why he believes Ernest Hemingway had the impact that he had. If you read a passage from, let's say, A Farewell to Arms, he writes, In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. He writes indefinite. If you had sent this book back 200 years in time, people would think this guy is crazy. What do you mean, the river? I haven't been there. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know you. Why are you writing to me like this? But Ernest Hemingway was the first generation of writers who lived in a world where you had the telegraph. And when you have the telegraph, people all of a sudden, subconsciously, become used to hearing about things happening on the other side of the planet in real time. So if I would have brought ChatGPT back in time to the day before Ernest Hemingway released his first book, ChatGPT could have never figured out that this is a way to write a new, cool, fresh story. Because you can only feel and sense that you're doing something that you're not supposed to do, but you want to do it anyway. You can't do that with rationality. So, another example that I love is from cognitive linguist George Lekhoff, pointing out that the sentence, let's say I drive by my friend's house, he's painting his house. And I ask him, why paint it red? Why not paint it blue? The second line is a negation, but meaning-wise, it's an affirmation. A rational system cannot grasp that. You can't mathematize that just like you can't mathematize what Hemingway did. We don't know how to mathematize it. We don't know how to build a formal system for it. In my own culture, where I come from, Iran, there is this game that's called tarof. So if I have friends over, I have to offer them to stay the night, even though I really don't want to. I want to wake up alone the next day. But I have to do it, and they have to kindly refuse the offer. And then we have to do this back and forth. Sometimes you just do it once, then it's over. Thank you, see you tomorrow. Sometimes you have to do five, six rounds. It depends on what we have talked about and how the sentiment has been that night. And a tiny mistake can be devastating. We can't formalize that. We can't mathematize that. All of you have had a teacher that profoundly changed the way you view a subject. We don't know how to create that teacher. We haven't figured out how to mathematize that, how to formalize that. We don't know how it's done. We can teach people to play like Mozart, but we don't know how to make someone become a new Mozart. It's not mathematizable. It's not a formal system that can capture it. The number of books about leadership are more than ever on the market, but the number of really good leaders are always the same. We don't know how to teach leadership because we can't mathematize that. We can't formalize that. 
So when we're afraid of machines taking over our work, machines can't do half of the things that only we can do, the things you can't formalize and put in a mathematical machine. It's what Jean-Michel Ogourlian calls the emotional brain. That's where we have our intuition, the ability to think simultaneously. We can use emotions and sense that something that's wrong on paper feels right and I'm going to do it anyway. A rational machine can't do that. The emotional brain is good at synthesizing different parts that seemingly have no meaningful connection. It sees relations, not objects. It sees the whole, not the part, and it sees patterns. So ChatGPT and all these new AI texts that we have, what they really are are just extensions of our so-called rational brain. And it's just part of a larger whole, that's the internet. And it's here to stay. I love to use it. I mean, I would not choose my feet over a car if I had to get to a destination and my life depended on it. So why should I pretend that I can be more rational, faster, more effectively than this machine? Let the machine do that work. But anything that can be broken down into parts and formalized into instructables that you can instruct somebody else to do, the rational machine can do it much better which means there will be less and less room for mediocrity. When you can formalize something, no one is going to be willing to pay for it anymore because the rational machines can do the formalized stuff much faster than us. But your profession, like many others, is not only about breaking things into parts and instructions and sequential systems. There is a huge part in your case that can only be handled by the so-called emotional brain. And on that department, the machine has nothing on us. So, yes. Can we do one question, perhaps? Sure. Yes. So we'll take one question from uh, Slido. Yes. If we, so thank you very much. Uh, we can have applause to Akhtar. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And let's see what we have uh, the most uh, upvoted uh, Slido question. I'll just switch systems here. Switch. Uh, you may, or you take the most uh, upvoted there on top. Oh, okay. <laughs> How would the speaker apply or relate the content of his talk to translation profession? I told you in the beginning, I'm not here to solve problems. <laughs> I have no clue. I don't know what you guys are doing. I don't know. But I think we need to put things in the right context. And 99% of the discussions I see on AI make the false assumption that the world is mathematical and the brain can be broken down by math. There is nothing that guarantees that. There is no evidence that the universe and cosmos is mathematical. Mathematics is a human-invented concept. That doesn't mean the world and cosmos is mathematical. So we have to kill the false assumptions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. My That's pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, and uh, now I would like to invite the next panel chair, Anna Windham, uh, with, on stage with her panel members to discuss the AI paradigm.